Harold Davis. I'm here to teach you about the art and craft of digital photography. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Harold Davis Studio in Berkeley, California. We are so pleased to have you with us today. Today's webinar is Processing Black and White Landscape and Architecture, Part 2. Today, Harold will start with a review of the previous Processing Black and White Landscape and Architecture webinar. Then Harold will focus on the many monochromatic creative opportunities that are available once basic black and white conversion has been achieved. Today's webinar will highlight the palette of creative possibilities that you can have at your fingertips when you work on your black and white images. Examples will be shown and detailed recipes will be explained. Specific ideas for creating ongoing monochromatic work and projects in the landscape and architectural arenas will be discussed. Many of you know who Harold Davis is, but if you're joining us for the first time today, Here's a bit about Harold. Harold Davis is an artist, photographer, and author. His most recent books include Creative Black and White, Second Edition, and Creative Garden Photography, both published by Rocky Nook. Harold is the developer of a unique technique for photographing flowers for transparency and an innovator of digital multi-raw processing and hand HDR processing. Harold is an internationally known photographer. His prints are widely collected and he is a sought after workshop leader. He is a Moab master and a Zeiss ambassador. Harold's website is digitalfieldguide.com. Now I am going to stop my share and hand it over to Harold. Hi everyone. That's quite an introduction to live up to. I always hear it and I go, ah, <laughs> what am I gonna say after that? So we've got a complicated and exciting presentation today and it's parts of three. And I'm not saying parts of three about some weird compositional theory or something like that. But what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna recap part one. I, I, from what I saw in the chat box, most people have either been to, were either at the first webinar or caught up with it on YouTube, but I'm still gonna recap it. The, then second part of the presentation is gonna move into my workflow theory of black and white processing, which as you'll see is itself in three parts. And then the third part of the presentation will involve showing some actual processing in honor of Ansel's 119th birthday. May he be happily uh, photographing wherever he is up there. Uh, we'll start with an Ansel Adams effect. Um, with that, let's please, please do throw your questions into the chat box. I look forward to hearing from you. And without further ado, uh, ado or a don't, I am going to share my screen. This is Black and White Landscape and Architecture Part Two. Um, for better or for worse, I I decided when I was um, when when I was making these uh, webinars to divide the topic up into architecture and landscape, and then close ups and still lives because they are kind of different. But processing them is not so different. So uh, some of what I'm saying here will apply both ways around. Here's the cover of Creative Garden Photography the uh, creative black and white second edition, our latest black and white book, a bit of the table of contents. One of the further slides in this presentation is gonna to refer to the actual pages in the book, which is a way to follow along and know what I'm talking about without having to take notes necessarily. And if I have to refer to my own book, which happens, believe it or not, um, I'm, I'm sure you will forgive me as we go along. So here's one of the first parts of three that I was talking about. Um, my thought and my process for converting to black and white to monochrome really has three parts. 
And the first part there, the raw conversion, is something that we did in the last session, and I will recap in a moment. That includes, by the way, uh, both hand HDR and automated HDR, multi-capture multi black and white photography. Um, the second stage for me and, and the process, the way I do it, is to manipulate the color so that it can be converted more effectively to black and white. And this is an important and perhaps somewhat subtle point. Um, whatever, whatever technique you use to convert, whatever technique you use to convert to black and white, and I, I really don't care what it is, whether it's uh, an adjustment in Lightroom Photoshop, whether it's Nick Silver FX, needs hooks. The hooks are the color. So the color that you have in your image before you do a mon apply a monochrome conversion is, is the raw data that the monochrome conversion works with. So one place where you can really impact the quality of your monochrome is in the, in the color. If that sounds paradoxical, perhaps it is, but it is what I do. It is what I recommend, and I will show um, several, at least several examples of this in practice as, as we move along here. When we get to the demo stage of this operation. The third stage, which we'll also talk about here to some extent, is black and white special effects. That is, once you already have a monochrome image, however derived, what can you do to it to apply special effects? This might be something like a pinhole effect, it might be toning, it might be tinting, it might be vignetting, it might be applying a frame. There's uh, one, one effect that I've developed, I call the Blossfeld effect after uh, nature photographer Carl Blossfeld. That is something I'll go into detail on in the close-ups and still lives webinar, but you'll, you'll see, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do a bunch of recipes basically here. I'm not a recipe person, but uh, in, in, for some uh, aspects of um, how you apply a special effect to a monochromatic image, a nice uh, recipe is just what the doctor ordered. Another example here is solarization. And speaking of parts of three, if I get to it, I will show you three different solarization techniques. Incidentally, uh, well, I'll, I'll explain it when we get there. Okay, so this is the recap. I thought I'd start with a few nice black and white images. Showed, I showed these last time. I showed a demo of this one last time, how this is really a two, a two layer process, one for the clouds, one for the sky. Here, here's our monochromatic visions portfolio with uh, black and white prints. My thought in thinking about black and white is to view the process as basically a feedback loop where you iterate through it. You learn to think and, and, and be conceptual in black and white. And then when you recognize you've done it, you go back and iterate the process and down this triangle as things get more definite and more you, you eventually get to editing and showing black and white. I want to uh, emphasize that for me, and I, I recommend it for you as well, the process of post-production for a monochrome image is just as much an issue of pre-visualization and creativity as taking the photo. This is a little bit like saying that um, in the dark room, it's, there's artistry to be done in the dark room as well as in the actual camera in back in the film days. I don't think anyone would have disagreed with that back uh, you know, 50 years ago in the, in the heart of the film era of photography. Everyone knew that the dark room was a place where you could express your creativity. Not everyone had the chops to do it well. Sometimes they would work with a partner or a technician who would do the dark room part, but everyone knew that this was an important part of art photography. Well, nothing about that has changed. It's still an important part of art photography. The image series that I'm showing here all benefited from extensive post-production. And, and the process of 
digital photography as opposed to analog photography has become a, a, a process that is a fairly technical one, as in the content management system overview shown here with a production system. You need backups. You know, for example, here we use a, set, uh, a system of a network attached storage boxes configured in RAID 5. You need expertise and all kinds of things digital to really be effective as a uh, digital monochrome photographer or really uh, um, the any kind of photograph at all. Jennifer Marano asks the question, when you create a monochrome image using your system, is it true monochrome? My club has been having controversy about other colors being present in the digital image as seen in the histogram or the numbers of each channel being different from each other. These images still appear monochrome to the naked eye. Uh, Jennifer, this is an interesting question. We talked about it a bit last time. Um, I'm not so much interested in terminology. This is, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I don't really care about linguistic, uh, linguistic analysis. Uh, from a technical viewpoint, technical viewpoint, with the exception of the Leica Monochrome M, all, uh, all cameras are photographing the world in color. All raw files are potentially color files. All workflow that go through uh, ACR, Lightroom, anything else are color files, even if they're presented in black and white. The, so this is a, an issue of nomenclature, not really, uh, not really present. I mean, if you're going to present an image that's toned and sepia, that can be called monochrome, just as one that's blue and looks, you know, like a uh, like it's blue tinted monochrome. If you take apart the words mono and chrome, just means one color. The that's a different issue from the technical one of the file, which is that the file is a color file. You're generally presenting an RGB file, even if, or, or CMYK file, even if the value is taking CMYK, even if black is the only thing that's there. Even when you go and you print something like a high quality book, as Phyllis can tell you, the black that the printer uses is never just black because that would look, um, dull and unsatisfying. It usually has some mix of other colors in it, like red. If Jennifer, if you have further questions about this, please feel free to address them. But I guess the, sh the short answer is it's true digital monochrome with that uh, digital in there. It's not the same thing as using a capture medium such as black and white film was that can only record certain kinds of light. And Harold, uh, can I throw something in too? Please. Um, I was just thinking also about color spaces, RGB, red, green, blue, which is what um, your computer monitor is projecting. Um, a monochrome image or black and white image will have, you know, because you're displaying it on a monitor, will have red, green, and blue values. If you don't have those values, it's either going to be just white, nothing, or, or all black. So you have to have the RGB in order to project it on your monitor. Same thing with CMYK. You can't, you know, you could have an image that's say 50% black, but then the, uh, the CMY, the cyan, yellow, and magenta, they add the toning that you would normally get in a black and white image, say Ansel Adams images that he printed in the dark room he's got a whole huge range of tone and that's what those other um channels are doing they're giving you the tones so that's my little thing that i was well well, about. well i mean we, we could spend all day talking about this but just <laughs> <laughs> and might have fun doing it but but just to you know back particularly before before you know 40 years ago in computing history there were just black and white monitors fairly commonly out there in point of fact and you know that's a little bit like saying well you could pick up a monochrome m and just do black and white captures i i know a very prominent um basically a journalist style photographer who uses a camera set to output black and white JPEGs and never does anything else with them. And, but those, that black and white mix is still an RGB file. 
And uh, Ron says, everybody, please, when you put a uh, when you put something in the chat box, turn on all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see it. And I thank you for that too. The point of this workflow is that basically I'm and I hope we are fundamentally in the square down at the bottom right, the raw capture square. So you're processing a raw file. In some cases, you're combining multiple raw files for, for monochromatic HDR. Then you convert to black and white using a layer stack. And I, you know, if I were, if I had the space in this diagram, I would put a box as we'll see later today in between the process for color um, and namely manipulate the color post-processing. And then after you have it black and white, you have optional special effects such as toning and tinting. And the, the um, histogram shown here, the, the histogram graph shown here just says basically no pain, no gain. If you if you do a JPEG conversion in your camera, you may get some you may get something. My journalistic friend to the despite who gets really wonderful results um, out of his camera. It happens to be a, a Leica and a pretty good processor. But be be that as it may, what I use is a complex pro a project where it often takes me longer in the digital darkroom than it did to make the photo. So here's an example of a photo of mine that's become fairly well known. And this was the original raw capture shown in uh, Adobe Camera Raw. Here's the color version. And I heightened the colors here, particularly in things like the tree trunks, I added yellow. And here's what the layer stack for converting the color image to black and white looks like. You can see that it took me one, two, three, four, five, six, ten layers. I have the background color layer at the bottom of the stack. Every time I duplicated the layer, put on another black and white process, added it, sometimes masked, often not at full uh, at full opacity. So the point here is that using this kind of layer at layer stack and layer mask and painting and the gradient tool, you can, with pinpoint accuracy, convert different parts of a color image in different ways. And here is the uh, monochromatic rendition of this image. Once again, for Jennifer and your camera club, this is a monochromatic image. It's an RGB file that, you, that you're looking at, an sRGB file, which is necessary for creating a JPEG that can be displayed on a monitor. And if you want to be really accurate about the technology underneath, it's a digital monochromatic file. The point of this uh, slide here is to encourage pre-visualization. So pre-visualization for photography and also for post-production. It's a, it's a tripartite process. I promised you that the theme today would be threes. This is looking up uh, in the darkness to a ribbon of light in Antelope Canyon near Page, Arizona. And my point really with showing this image is that you just because you have data in an in a image, monochrome or otherwise, does not mean that you always have to show everything in the image. You can see that the final form of this image is sort of sinuous like a snake or a ribbon of light, as I said at first. But if I'd wanted to, I could have shown all the detail on the top and the bottom. A lot of being a good photographer or indeed good artist is showing what you want to show and not showing what you don't want to show. Sometimes, this is very important, sometimes not revealing everything is much more powerful than showing everything. And this goes for how you deploy uh, monochromatic HDR techniques and multi captures as well as everything. That we have the power to do things doesn't mean that we always want to do them. And these are more inspiration here. With this image of this model on uh, Passy Station, um, 
on the other side of the river from the Eiffel Tower. It's really two exposures that were blended, one for the right with the train and one for the left with the model. And I put them together with a simple gradient across them. And uh, the tower is in Prague. Okay, so here, this is a recap of the assignments, as it were, that uh, that the people who were in the last webinar worked on: repetition, high key, low key, old fashioned look. Here's some repetition: an old train bridge. What's notable about this image for me? This is an old train bridge. Uh, near Bath, Maine, not really used much anymore, at least so I was hoping when I was standing there with my tripod. The thing that is interesting for me, one of them is I put myself into this at the one pixel level, but you really couldn't see that without, uh, let's say a large print and a good magnifying glass. This is a recent uh, image of a bike rack on the UC Berkeley campus with uh, repetition that is a pandemic image because UC Berkeley would normally have tons of bikes chained to this thing. I found a fun house mirror with repetition. The object here would be to get myself out of it and repetition on the uh, Marcos Grove of Trees on Point Reyes National Seashore underneath the Berkeley Municipal Pier. The Pont Valentra in uh, Cahors, France. Well, sort of this is not landscape and architecture, but I allowed myself one. Okay, so here's a here's my favorite, current favorite high key image with a train bridge cutting across San Francisco Bay, uh, photographed and processed to emphasize the contrast between the horizontal line cutting across it and the whiteness of the bay and the clouds. A night photograph of an island in San Francisco Bay, again, processed to emphasize the high key aspects. This is a more or less low key image on the on Reichenau Causeway in uh, Lake Constance on the uh, German Swiss Austrian border leading to a very famous monastery on Reichenau Island. Darkness and low key shadows in Sundong Cave in Vietnam. The Eureka Dunes in Death Valley. And again, this was an example that I worked through last time. Um, and you can check it out if you want to go back to the recording with a shaft of light coming over the dunes and then darkness on all the lower aspects of the image. And this is Phyllis's uh, riff on an old fashioned type font. Thank you, Phyllis. This is a uh, basically soft focus uh, effect here on this image. Well, that's one thing we'll get to. And a couple more old fashioned sepia tinted monochrome images. This one's more like a 1930s uh, industrial kind of thing. So color manipulation for black and white. What are we, and this, so we're moving on from recap to new material here. Any questions about the recap before I move on? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> anytime you want to ask a question, it's fine. Uh, so <sighs> fundamentally, and, I, and perhaps the order of these things is not correct, but um, layers and blending modes, color modification, hand HDR. I could add to this uh, using uh, texture overlays, also doing compositing. You know, one of the things we say about Photoshop is there are always are a million ways to do everything. Remember that where this goes in the workflow, you've got, okay, well, on the one hand, number one, you're converting the thing uh, from via ACR to a color image. Number two, you're doing something to the color to give, to give black and white processing more to grip, an important and subtle point. Number three, you're then converting to black and white. So here's an example. 
this image along the Oregon coast at Cape Perpetua. Uh, this, this is a default process through ACR of the image. I will prove to you that it's the default one when we look at this as an example by showing you actually the raw file in, uh, in Bridge. Okay, so here's the way the final color version of this image ended up. Here's the monochromatic version. Let's be careful and note that I would not have been able to get to the monochromatic version without the intermediate step of the color version. Okay. Here are, uh, time permitting, here are some of the black and white effects that I'm going to demonstrate. Um, and, the, and the corresponding pages in Creative Black and White, second edition. This part three of the book, this is the table of contents of part three of the book. And basically what it's all about are various special effects. And here's a list of what they are. So uh, before I move on to demonstrations, I'm going to give a bit of inspiration and suggestions about what you might want to do with black and white looking and photography for that matter, looking to the future and looking ahead. And, and so just like we gave some suggested assignments between part one and part two of this webinar, I'm going to do that looking ahead to the future. Um, finding what matters. Well, what matters to me in this image is are the light beams actually. Without the light beams, this is nothing. It's just a just a cement bridge somewhere. Um, so you're photographing light. Light is important. The only thing you can actually photograph is light that's emitted or reflected by an object. You can't photograph objects themselves. I want very much to look forward right now. I believe we are at the beginning of the end of the coronavirus pandemic. I myself received my second vaccination shot last night. So I'm in a very forward looking mood. I want to try to understand what comes next. I don't think we're going back to business as usual, but I think we are going to be ending the pandemic in the next six months. So maybe Paris will reopen and I'll get back to Paris. I would like that. Oops, I went too fast there. Let's see. So this was photograph. I photographed this bench at, on the outside of the uh, Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller Garden in near Seal Harbor in Maine. And you know, my point here on finding what matters is let you don't necessarily look at what's straight ahead of you. You look around. You see whether there are benches besides flowers. Here's some nice architectural. The finding oneself through one's photographs. These stairs were on the Kamonokoto pilgrimage trail on the key peninsula of Japan. The old uh, sort of cliche is want a photograph, want better photographs, stand in front of more interesting things. Well, that's only gets you part way there. Want to really make more interesting photographs, become a more interesting person. And this one is a purely an exercise in post-production. I called it down the rabbit hole for somewhat obvious reasons. And you can see that there are a lot of different uh, spiral rabbit holes in here. Some ideas if you feel stuck for staying creative. 
try limiting yourself. One lens, you can take that even further. One lens, one aperture, set it on aperture priority metering, put it at F11 or put it at F1.4 and, and just try that. A corollary to the one lens is what's the best zoom lens? It is your feet. Uh, photograph motion. Learn to photograph motion so you can stop motion. Learn to photograph motion so you create motion blur. Depth of field. Create an image where the point of the thing is the depth of field or the lack of it. Uh, shadows. Shadows are great and they happen to be a particularly good monochrome subject. Reflections are always interesting. Both shadows and reflections open the possibility to images that evoke a different and perhaps more magical world. Here's a motion photo, again, along the Kimono Kodo of uh, temple banners in Japan. And the point of the shutter speed in this image was to create a blur of the more quickly moving flags on the left-hand side of the image. Here's a depth of field image where what I did was I focused on the foreground of the stairs um, and let the figure in the, in the background, figures I should say in the background go completely blurry. Reflection along the uh, Camino de Santiago. Reflection in Isuin Gardens in Nara, Japan and reflections in a pond in Maine. Here's a shadow. This is a temple shadow on a wonderful Zen garden where the motion and the rocks evokes water drops and a storm. And you see the, sky, the ridge line of the temple as a shadow in this image. Here's a shadow selfie of mine. Uh, on, on the Richmond Bay Bridge in San Francisco on the pedestrian side, on one of the many long walks I've taken during this past year. You can see my shoes at the bottom of the image, my shoes and feet. And a shadow in more or less the same location, simple architectural composition. Shadows inside uh, in Mission Dolores in San Francisco, the first of the California Spanish missions. Here's a composition in Rio Major on the uh, Ligurian coast of Italy. And what you see here is, uh, this is to some extent, it's, there's a, some human interest here. It's about people who, for whom sunbathing on this rocky shore was important enough that they'll wedge, your, wedge their feet against the bars like that. And you can see the bars have been anchored down on, on this pier, but also it's about the shadows involved. And the shadows and light play an important role in this workbench uh, photo. So here's the discount code for our black and white book, H Davis 40 from the publisher only, not from Amazon, Garden 40. You can buy the book from Amazon, but you won't get this kind of discount. And I want to, before I move to some examples, are there any questions related to either the recap or the new part of the presentation? Um, I would be delighted to do my best to answer anything. Okay. Quiet bunch today, Harold. I was going to say, um, Phyllis, it sounds like you have something to ask me, right? I do. James has a question. What? Thank you, James, for giving me purpose in this <laughs> webinar. Thank you. <laughs> and Suzanne, too. Thank you. <laughs> James asks, what is the Ansel Adams effect? <laughs> uh, the Ansel Adams effect is a way of processing a color photo so that the black and white looks um, somewhat like an Ansel Adams black and white print. The Suzanne asks, if you are using HDR, assume you do that process first. Generally speaking, and not always, but generally speaking, yes. Uh, as I said, the process is first convert to color, then to black and white, then apply special effects. Uh, 
And Ron asks, have you ever tried infrared black and white? And the answer is sure. I've not only converted a camera via life pixels to use for black and white, but also often play with the, or fairly often play with the uh, infrared uh, conversion in post-production of various sorts. I cannot say that I am totally enamored of it. I prefer, you know, it, it, there are some really, really cool uh, infrared photos out there. Uh, it's it hasn't been something that's really stuck for me. And Jennifer, and Jennifer wants to wants more on gradients. We'll get there. Right, using gradients uh, between two layers. Yeah, I mean, one. I have to say that unfortunately, one answer to that is is basic Photoshop proficiency. But the and and we, I think we have a webinar or two on Photoshop as well as our as well as our uh, Photoshop books. Right. But, Right. Uh, but and there are, of course, many resources that have nothing to do with Harold and Phyllis that teach Photoshop. But I'll try to pull up an example or two that involves it and go through it uh, and, slowly. And, you yeah. know, my thing, the way I learn stuff is I just um, try it and see if I can just bash my head on it till I get it right or till it works the way I want it to work. And then I can just like delete it. Nobody ever sees the mess I've made. So, you know, I would say, you know, play with stuff. Great advice. I mean, yeah leap into things. Absolutely. So let's start with the Ansel Adams effect. Not, not only is it his 119th birthday, thank you Ron for that, but also um, question about what this is has come up quite a bit. So here's, a, here's an image I, that I took in from the tunnel view in Yosemite Valley on a year with massive snowfall. And it's pretty beautiful. As you can see, I amped the colors up a bit, perhaps a bit more than I would really want to do if I were presenting it as a color image. And what I'm going to now do is apply a channel mixer adjustment. That's here, here over here. You can see me pointing at the um, adjustments panel, you get to the adjustments panel by opening window adjustments, being Photoshop, there are probably other ways too. Um, the thing is about the little icons on the on the adjustments panel, I never can figure out most what most of them are supposed to be. I mean, by now, I'm pretty. I pretty much know that this one is black and white, but the things are so minuscule, you really have to sort of point your mouse pointer at it and read what the heck it is. But this one with the like three color things in black and white is the channel mixer, and the point of the channel mixer is you select what blend. You check the monochrome box you see here on the panel channel mixer, and you check what blend um, of colors from the three RGB color channels are supposed to go in to make to make a single channel output of a black and white image. Now the recipe for this and the step by step is in Creative Black and White. I think it's on page 140 and. 140, 141, and the values are that you want to set the red to 150, the green to 140, and the blue to minus 190, I think. The, so this is a pretty bizarre uh, set of, of, um, uh, of numbers for this thing, because in theory, the way this is supposed to work, um, it's supposed to add up to 100%. And it's obviously not exactly a hundred percent. So let's see, let me pull up the, let me pull up the um, channels panel go to the layers tab of the channels panel. Say that 10 times fast. And I'm gonna flip this on and off, okay? This is far from the default 
process of a black and white image. This is something like what Ansel Adams did where his blacks and whites got very, very, very dramatic. Okay, any questions about this? All right. I'm gonna shut the, uh, I'm gonna shut the adjustments panel and I'm back to history and layers and channels here. So, Here's the raw file that I made on, um, on um, let's see, a couple of years ago in October along the Oregon coast. Pretty, pretty simple raw file. So I pulled some of the actual conversions for that and let me open them up. Note that these are reduced bit depth and uh, a bit a bit depth and size so that this isn't an excruciating thing. What I put here is um, a a texture couple of different texture overlays to get the color changed. So I uh, wouldn't so look just a, just a small let me let me uh, delete this layer mask. Okay. So just as a sort of simple Here's, here's my texture overlay. This one came out of one of the flypaper textures texture pack. Um, so I, if I wanted to put a gradient on here, I could. I would go, and this is, this is for Jennifer. So layer, layer mask, hide all. And let's say that we want the gradient to show in the upper right corner. So I need to go from white to black, from the foreground color as shown here on the tools panel to black, the background color. And I draw it in using the gradient tool, which is selected on the tools panel, like say that. And then what I had done was I placed it in overlay blending mode like that. And here are the other ones that I put on there. Okay, let's go look at, um, let's go look at this one. So what I did here was to make the colors more vivid, I applied, uh, I applied Nick's Viveza software and I did that. And I can show you that in action in a minute. And here's the actual black and white uh, conversion stack. So <laughs> we have uh, the, we have the, you know, these were my shorthand for what I put on there. This is Nick's silver FX neutral default, default black and white. The next layer is um, a high contrast red preset out of Photoshop at 29%. 
then I have something uh, from Topaz Simplify at overlay and 21%, another Topaz Simplify at 51%, and this is Nick High Structure on top of it, and Nick High Contrast on top of that. So that this was the third part of my three-part paradigm, how to convert to black and white. I know it seems like a lot. Um, so let me go back. Let me go backwards. Okay, well, this is kind of okay for the slide for the sky. I don't know what happened to that. Let's let's do it again. Okay. So we have here, and I think I opened it twice by mistake because it was taking so long to get impatient with these things. Um, no, nope, just once, but it took it took its time. We're gonna have to, here, let me maximize this window. We're, oh yeah, I did open it twice. Well, we'll shut one of them. We're gonna have to, in a minute, cut things down just so that it doesn't take forever. But before I cut things down, let me open a second copy of this image with the idea with the second one. Perhaps you noticed in the final image that there were like beams of light coming down and so on and lighter stuff in the foreground. So you could actually see some of the details. Well, let's make some of that happen. So I'm gonna open it again. And this time I'm going to bring the blacks lighter. You can begin to see some of that. I'm going to bring the shadows lighter. And most important of all, I'm going to bring the exposure way lighter. So you see how that opens up the shoreline there? So this is about, from the raw exposure, this one is about uh, two EVs lighter than the original one. Let me put both of them. Let me let me get both of them a, a little bit uh, less resolution so that um, so that we can not have to wait forever. I'm putting them down to eight bits, and I'm going to put the size down to um, a hundred from three hundred. Easy enough to do this so that I can do both the same so that we won't have problems when we try to combine layers. So image mode, um, eight bits, image size. I'm intentionally throwing away resolution. Horrible, horrible, horrible thing to do. But I got to do it just for you um, who's watching this. Okay, so everybody understands that both of these versions of this image came from the one raw file. Are we, are we together here? Okay, if there are any questions about that, please, good, thank you. All good, Constance, I love it. Thanks, James. Yep, because okay. this is really fundamentally important to working with raw files. There are a number of different mechanics for doing it, but if you're not accessing uh, some of the the huge uh, spread of data in your raw file, you're missing out on part of what's so wonderful about digital photography. Good, 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 good. So I'm going to pull the lighter version over. Oops, I missed. Well, that happens. 
there we go. And let's, uh, let me just shut the lighter version. I don't really need it anymore. And let me make this a lot bigger so everyone can see it. Let me label it lighter. I'm going to call it as an approximation plus 2.5 EV, which is about what it was. We can call the background darker. And let's, let's, um, let's put a layer. Let, we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to treat this in two ways for starters. We're going to put a layer mask onto it, layer, layer mask, hide all. And I'm going to put a gradient to um, make the, the left quadrant of this a little lighter. And like, like so. Okay, that, that is really a pretty important move there. It, it this transforms this image from something utterly mundane to something that's got magical lighting in it. Look, image, utterly mundane, magical lighting, okay? I just drew a simple diagonal gradient from white to dark on it. Everybody with me here? Yes, I think so. Okay. So let me put the opacity of this layer down to 50%. So I'm losing some of my benefit. And because, you know, one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to create by, by going too light in Adobe Camera Raw conversions or Lightroom conversions or Capture One conversions, whatever you're using. You don't want to create a situation where you've in, unintentionally overexposed something that can go from, you know, something, an image that was really compelling to one that has aspects that just aren't so hot. So I've got to duplicate my light layer. Layer duplicate layer. So it's a copy. I'm going to take off my gradient tool. Delete layer mask. I'm going to put a new layer mask on. Layer, layer mask, hide all. And this time I'm going to use a brush tool. I will use it at 50% flow so that I can control it and something like 60% uh, opacity. And I'm going to specify uh, it looks like that is too much, but we'll take it down in a bit. Let's take it down right here a little bit. And, I, oops, you want beams to be spreading out. That's what they do naturally. So I'm drawing this beam spread out a bit here. And, oops, I didn't like that. What's my hardness here? I'm way too hard for this. I should be a nice soft brush, okay? So pay attention to how hard or soft your brush is. And let's get a little beam of light on that wave. And then let's take the opacity of this layer down like, like to here. Okay, so here's where we started. Here's the gradient for the left. Here are the beams of light. So I'm going to archive this. I go save and let's see we're gonna create a new folder here called wip which is short for work in progress create and we're gonna save it and i'm going to layer it down flatten image and i'm going to do a save as all right now, this is mundane stuff, but it's important workflow. Note that flattening an image, layer, flatten image, um, destroys pixels. It's one of the few things you can actually do in Photoshop that destroys pixels. There aren't a whole lot of things that can, but flattening your layers are. So that's why I archived a version beforehand. You know, suppose. Uh, somebody, when we get to the Q&A on this example, uh, which is, you know, I'm going to go through a number of steps before, before we do the Q&A. Uh, before, suppose somebody 
wants to um, ask me a question about this first version, I'll be able to get back to it because I've archived it. And the order is clear to me because I assign an alphabetical number to which version I am. I'm now on A, I'll go through B, I'll go through C and so on. And I don't really care if you used one, two, three, four, five or whatever, but as long as there's some sequential numbering, um, this came up for me in the real world in a real work project yesterday <laughs> where I was asked by an art director I'm working with on a very sweet project indeed, which I can't really discuss. I'm not at liberty to discuss the details at the moment, but eventually I will be. And so she asked me to produce versions of a couple of my images that were about 10% lighter in the background. Because I had saved every step of my workflow, doing that was not as grievous a job as it would otherwise have been. All I had to do was go back to the version just before the end of the thing, find that version, add a white layer, screen it in at 10%, and resave it, create a new master file and send off what she wanted. It took me maybe 15 minutes per image of the, of the half a dozen images that I had to do that on. If I hadn't saved archive versions, if I couldn't get back to a piece, um, um, it would be in trouble. Phyllis, do you want to tackle Ron's question as I as I move on here to the next step, which is, is there a website that covers the various gradients and their use in Photoshop? I think that we covered it somewhat in our Photoshop webinar and certainly in particularly the second of the two Photoshop darkroom books, but there are lots of gradients. They can be customized, you know, with Photoshop, the world's your oyster. Fundamentally, I use gradients very simply the simplest way possible. White to black gradients on, on layer masks mostly. If this, is not, this is not actually very complicated. And I think if you look through the Photoshop darkroom, you'd find what you need for that use of it. For other ones, I don't really know of any, but uh, probably there is somewhere. Maybe on LinkedIn Learning, they, they're a pretty good Photoshop resource. Okay. So what I'm next going to do is I'm going to apply some of the simpler blending modes to enhance this, um, this color image at this point. So but to do that, I go layer, duplicate layer, and let's first, let's first uh, screen it a bit, okay? So screening lightens gently. So lightening gently is what I wanted to do here. I'm gonna put a hide all layer mask on it. Layer, layer mask, hide all. And I am going to paint in, limp, limp. A little bit of those nice light beams and maybe a little bit of the shoreline down there too. And you know, you notice that there's a beam there as well. In, that's a little bit strong. So if it's too strong, I can go back over it with a black brush and cut down the intensity, which I do. So that's one thing to, here's what my layer mask looks like. So there, those are echoing light beams. Thank you, Phyllis. That's a great resource. I really like that. Um, people, please keep in mind that the use I'm showing of gradients is probably the kindergarten simplest use of them, okay? Very, very powerful, even at simple use, but there's a lot more that can be done with them. So this was a screen blending mode. Now I'm going to do a multiply blending mode. Layer, duplicate layer. Might as well call it multiply so we know what we're doing. And we'll put it into multiply blending mode. Multiply makes darker. So let's do two things with multiply. Let's get a little bit of sort of contrast into the sky. Layer, 
layer mask hide all and let's just paint it in from the upper right down like that one of the point and then i'm going to take that way down way 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 down about like that so one of the things to keep in mind about drawing your gradient on a layer mask is you want to go a little bit beyond the point you want if you if you stop abruptly at a line that'll show up it won't look natural part of the point of using something like a gradient as a pro as opposed to a brush tool is a way to make things look very very natural okay let me duplicate my multiply layer blending mode duplicate layer all righty i'm gonna knock off my layer mask delete layer mask and go to 100 percent like that I'm going to put my a new layer mask on it layer layer mask hide all i'm going to make my brush nice and big i'm going to take opacity down to about 30 percent maybe and i'm going to make my blacks blacker one way that you create drama is to enhance contrast so what i'm doing here is a I may have these beams of light, but I also want to make sure that I've got contrast with the parts like that that aren't so light. Now, let me add one more layer. This one we're going to put into soft light blending mode. So two of the blending modes, overlay and soft light, are, are primarily used to increase contrast. So that, so that is just a quick way to increase contrast overall. Obviously, if you increase it at 100%, that is not good. That defeats the point of it. Um, I analogize applying filters in Photoshop to homeopathy, okay? So the idea behind homeopathy for whatever it's worth, I'm not saying anything for or against it. If you know that a person is allergic to something or it's bad for them, if you give them a little tiny bit of it, it'll be okay. So soft light blending mode at 100% is um, technically speaking, God awful. At 12%, which is where I usually use it for this kind of thing, it's really, it enhances things. So let's let's save this. And then let me run through what I just did. Here's where we started after our raw process. Here's adding a screen to enhance the lights. Here's multiplying to make the sky darker. Here's multiplying to make the land between the light beams darker and here is soft light at 12 percent to increase overall contrast any questions about this before i move on familiarizing yourself with photoshop blending modes is perhaps the single most important thing you can do to enhance post-production processing <laughs> yeah it's it's cool stuff okay flatten save as this flattened save as should become like a litany like every time you do it you know whenever I, it took me a little uh, i have been doing digital photography since 2005 that's nigh on 16 years at this point we won't go into how long i did film photography before then because that's such a, a different story you know, Phyllis will tell you that when we get image requests going back to the early years of this stuff, it can be really difficult to fill because I wasn't as organized about how I stored my backup archives and all that. So it's really important. The sooner you do this in an organized way, the happier a camper you're going to be. Fair enough, Phyllis? Yep. And you'll make your archivist happy too. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's let's add some uh, third party filter effects here. Layer. 
duplicate layer, filter, Nick Collection, Color FX Pro. You really have your choice with this stuff. I mean, there, though, as you know, there are like only squint million, uh, only squint million uh, effects possible in something like Color FX Pro. You can apply it selectively. You can apply it to overall to an image. What I tend to do <clears throat> is over apply and then take down the uh, opacity of the overall layer that I applied it to. So here. Um, when you when typically when you pull up the Nick Glamour Glow filter, which is a great filter, I really love it, out of the box, its saturation's at zero and glow warmth is, is at zero. And typically I move them up to something like uh, 25 or 30 percent. And that produces a fairly significant change in the image. Okay. So I can label this and call it Glamour Glow. And I'll put the opacity of the overall layer down to about 30% like that. So here, here, yeah, you know, I can see it. I'm not 100% sure whether you can see it, but, but it's not a huge change. Okay, you don't want these things to be huge changes for the most part. Okay, so let me take another layer, layer, duplicate layer, and I'm going to I'm going to move back into Nick um, FD, uh, Nick Color FX, and so I, I told you my homeopathy principle here. Well, the other theory I go by here is a kind of Hegelian dialectic, and that is whenever you do a move in one direction, you want to do a move in the opposite direction. So glamour glow essentially is softening, saturating, putting a glow on things. The tonal contrast filter is sharpening things up, making contrast sharper, getting rid of glow. So I'm going to take the default values for everything, just going to use tonal contrast like that. And what I'm going to do with tonal contrast, as opposed to glamour glow, which I just applied generally, is I'm going to put it in with a brush selectively. Layer, layer mask, hide all. I've got my brush tool. Let me set it up a little higher. And it's nice. And what I'm going to do is use it around the edges of things. See, so I'm painting in the edge of the light beam like that. I'm going to paint it here. You want to use this on edges fundamentally. Okay, here's what my tonal contrast layer mask looks like. All right, let me go and add another filter. You can add as many filters as you want. And keep in mind that this is, a, again, a somewhat subtle uh, thought, technically. It's a different effect to apply three filters one by one to a single background than to apply one filter after you've already applied two filters. So the order you do things in matters, the size of the layer stack matters. You can get different effects, and you may have to go back and try them differently. Layer, duplicate layer. In other words, I'm about to apply uh, something here from the uh, Topaz universe on top of these two nicks. If I apply it here in this layer stack, it is less. It has a different impact than if I had layered down the existing layers and then apply it. So be careful about that. Be careful. It's dangerous in Photoshop out there. Okay, let's apply from Topaz has adjust. Let's hope this thing works for me. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Yep, we're good. This is from Topaz adjust. Um, there are all kinds of nutty stuff you can do here. Color blast. Well, that's a little over the top for me. I sometimes, the exposure color stretch I sometimes like, although it's kind of uh, nutty in this case. The detail will add a lot of detail. 
detailed color isn't bad. I don't know where that purple is coming from. It's kind of, um, you want something to look more like the setting sun. There you go. Again, here, let's, let's add a little of dynamic setting sun. Let's keep in mind that you would never use this at 100% opacity because it looks like, it looks like uh, poo poo. Um, technically speaking, I'm going to take my layer mask from the tonal contrast and hold down the alt key and pull it up over this one. There you go. That's not bad. And now I am going to take the opacity of that layer. Uh, th this was dynamic sunset topaz adjust. And I will take it down to, oh, 28%. So starting with the background, which we, which which we got from a layer stack. I'm now adding two Nick filters and one Topaz filter. Okay, any questions about this? I'm going to archive it and layer it on down. So yeah. this, is, this is number C here for the layers. And I, I wanna go back for a second and have a, this is where I'm going to apply some textures over the top. I just want to, since I had that before, so I don't have to reinvent the wheel, I want to see what they were. I'll show, show that. So we've got Samov and Casanova. Somebody want to remember those for me? Let's go find them. Um, so let's see, backgrounds and textures, textures, flypaper textures, oh, some of and Casanova, where are you? Should be fair. I should have prepared this. My uh, my bad. Well, what I can actually do, you can see how you can find these things. What I can actually do is go back. Is just open it up in the uh, one in the one that I had instead of uh, instead of making you wait for me to paw through them. So I'm opening up this version from the real thing. And what I'm going to do here is I am going to note that I have that kind of layer mask on here. I'm going to, I could copy my layer mask too, but I'm not going to do that. And I note that I'm in overlay blending mode. So I'm just copying some of over here. Pretend I got it out of the flypaper set rather than uh, rather than just pull it over. There we go. And we want to put it in overlay blending mode. And we want to put a layer, layer mask, hide all. And we want to put a gradient like that. And we want to put the opacity down like perhaps that. Okay, now let's pull a Casanova over. And the Casanova overlay at 34% and screen at 34%. I, I think the screen at 34% is basically irrelevant. I'm going to delete this layer mask and, and, um, here is my Casanova. It's nice that it's sized for me already. Um, so here would be Casanova at normal 100%. Okay. And basically, we're going to put a gradient on here that is fundamentally the opposite of the, of the other gradient here. The point is to golden eyes and yellow things a bit and add some texture to them. Um, so let's see, let's put this into overlay and layer, layer mask, hide all. And I'm going to put it like that and then put it down into the 30s. Okay. So 
again, I'm moving for I'm moving fairly quickly. Uh, <laughs> oh, Mark. <laughs> Mark says stunned, perhaps. Uh, now nah, we hope not. Here's here's the sum off overlay 66% gradient tool. Here's the Casano over overlay other direction just to just to roll through the uh, layer masks. Here's the overlay going in this direction. Here's the mask going in this direction. So questions about this before I move on. Yanli, can you please explain why you need to add color to the sunbeam for a black and white photo? Again, you need to add color to every part of a photo if you're going to give the black and white converter data to work on. So it's a good question. As I said, this is a counterintuitive technique. It's important to understand. If you don't have good oversaturated, perhaps, color in a black and white image, you won't have good hooks for your color conversion. So I'm not going to go too much further on this. I'm going to start a black and white conversion process. You saw uh, you I here. Let me let me open up the open up the layer stack we uh, we had for the black and white one so you can see it. So um, yeah, you know, let, let me diddle around with it and start converting. But you see, you see what this kind of thing looks like. It's pretty extensive. What you always want to do when you start your black and white, your monochrome layer stack, is you always want to leave your, let me get the uh, layer panel channel up again. You always want to leave your color at the, on the, at the bottom. So if you leave your color at the bottom, the first black and white layer has to be at 100% normal opacity to fully hide the color. This is an important step. And it should also be a fairly neutral conversion, even if later on you're going to do something kind of radical. Some of some black and white conversions are pretty radical. Um, let me sh I'll show you in a little what I mean. Filter, Nick Collection, Silver FX Pro, and we'll just use the neutral SFX neutral on this for our hide the bottom layer. In point of fact, this is not a bad black and white conversion right here. Okay, so this Yanli, this is a partial answer to your question of why you present interesting color for the black and white to work on. Okay, so this is silver FX neutral to hide bottom, to hide color, right? Um, let's, let's go add a Photoshop adjustment next. Um, layer, duplicate layer. What I tend to do on the Photoshop black and white adjustments is first of all, I pull them up off the actions panel. Oh, I mean, uh, off the adjustments panel. And second of all, which you can see right up here, it's this black and white icon. And second of all, I tend to use the presets to see what they look like. So let's go with high contrast red here. So what high contrast red does is it amps the difference between the sunbeams and the mountains. Layer. Well, let's see. So now what we have here, let me let me put my layer down, merge it down. And this is Photoshop adjustment um, high C red. And so I'm going to put a layer mask onto it. Layer, layer mask, hide all. And I'm going to paint that in with the gradient so that this part is more high contrast, just like that. And actually to create some, if you if you saw how that gradient worked, here's the, here it is. It, the stuff nearer on this side is lighter than as you move along. So it's creating some contrast and flow in the lighting. Let's, 
let's um, add a um, another Nick Silver FX layer into this thing. Let's let's. Oh, before I do that, let me see what the uh, uh, the IR preset in uh, in the adjustment layers due to uh, due to the light beams. That te it tends to be very good on things like light beams. So let's let's try that out and see. So here it is. It's infrared. Oh yeah, that's quite cool. So I'm going to close that down. I'm going to go layer merge down. That's merging down there is a way to get the adjustment onto a solid layer for archiving purposes, basically, and for ability to work on it. So this is a PS adjustment IR. And we'll put a layer mask on it. Layer, layer mask, hide all. And what I'm going to do is paint in the light beams with that. I'm going to take a brush that's a little bigger than the biggest light beam like that and paint it in. It's, I think, perhaps a little hard to see this over Zoom, but it's a noticeable effect. And remember that people don't always, aren't always aware of subtle effects consciously, but unconsciously they are. Here's what the uh, layer mask looks like. You know, the reason that I spend a lot of time with my images of cleaning up things like uh, gribblies and stuff like that on my image, you know, with the kind of size that these files have, they're big. Not so much this one that I'm working on, but, you know, something coming out of a, a modern camera, a Nikon D850, is a pretty big file in 16 bits. It, when you take something like that and reproduce it at 8 by 10, your average uh, dot in the sky isn't going to show very much. Back in the film days, one would spend time spotting, matching out in prints, that kind of thing with a paintbrush. Boy, was that a nuisance. Because uh, if you got it wrong, the whole print was ruined. These days, I spend time with... Um, Photoshop's tools retouching out for sure, because even if you don't really see them, well, I would know they're there for starters. Okay, I'm going to duplicate my layer, layer, duplicate layer, and just let's just look at a couple of um, a couple of uh, more radical Nick Silver FX uh, possibilities here, and then we'll call it a wrap on this example. Phyllis, do you think I have time for, yeah, I can't leave without doing solarization, but this is taking a little longer than I thought it would. Let's see. So high contrast is interesting. Look what that does. Isn't that beautiful in a way? The sections right here and right here. And part of what you can do, okay, I've got to use that. Part of what you can do with something like, um, uh, that's beautiful in part is use it on the part that it's beautiful on. Obviously this is too dark overall. So this is S SFX high contrast, harsh. We don't want to be harsh. So let's put it into overlay blending mode and that's even harsher. And then let's put a layer mask on it. Layer, layer mask, hide all. And then let's just paint in at about 30% opacity, this part right there. See how that became all of a sudden uh, defined? It's a, let me just zoom in on that. Okay, so here's what I just added to make the surf and the light beams there lo really look like something. This is a little bit of pinpoint accuracy of silver FX, high contrast harsh, just like that. Very, very small part of the image, right? But you have to pay attention to the details and then the overall picture can work. Okay, I said that would be my last one, but I think I have to do another one too. Duplicate layer, too much is never enough, right? So let's put this one into uh, Nick's um, um, high structure preset. I have to say, by the way, in fairness, that Nick Silver FX is not the only third party plugin I use. I use On One software and I use Topaz's black and white, which are both very good and have different looks. Uh, 
but you know, silver FX is really my go-to. So here's high structure, harsh. And actually this is something that might work nicely overall. So this is, high structure is really a way of saying, let's add detail. So certainly don't like it at 100%, but at, oh, 24%, it's really awesome. Okay, so let's look at what we, let me, let me hit control S, save it. And let's look at what we got here, what we have here. We started with this color version like this, which had as the last pat this. Okay, we. We started with a multiple multiple raw processing, a multi raw processing, a lighter version, and a darker version. We added them together so that we could see the foreground and the sunbeams. Then we added a series of blending modes to increase contrast and overall likability. Then we added a texture over the top to add some color, particularly to the sunbeams. Then we converted to black and white, primarily in the bottom layer with the neutral default silver FX process, a little bit of Photoshop high contrast red to make the details on the left come out, uh, Photoshop IR to make the light beams become lighter, uh, high contrast harsh just for the very little portion where the light be the second light beam and the light beams hit the waves to increase the resolution in that part of it. And then overall at 24% uh, silver FX high, uh, high structure harsh to add some detail into the whole image. So possibly a good news about this is that I'm going to show three different uh, solarization techniques and the, the possibly the good news about this is that I'm using the images from the book. You can you can look at either an online version or the printed version of it and see what I did if anything isn't really clear. Let's talk a little about uh, solarization. In the in the chemical wet dark room to solarize a print meant to turn on the light before it was fully developed. <laughs> okay, I don't know who found this. Man Ray, the uh, artist photographer Man Ray was one of the first great practitioners of it. Uh, perhaps it was an accident that he grew to, grew to love as some accidents are. The point is that it's not really a digital technique. So just like as the discussion at the beginning of this webinar about what monochrome really is. Monochrome is simulated black and white using a color file. Solarization, digital solarization is a simulation. Once you simulate something, then um, anybody's guess is good. What is it really? So, um, <laughs> let's uh let's solarize kimmy one version is to use lab color so image mode lab and then i am going to invert the l channel here in the channels panel i have the lightness channel l channel selected i have the eyeballs on all channels I go image, adjustment, invert. And that's a pretty nice solarized image. Then I move my image and note that I just clicked up here so that I have all three channels selected. I move my image back into RGB color space and I apply, I apply a, uh, let's see, what did, I, what did I do in the book? I apply a simple, uh, no, nope, that's not good. Let's do auto, auto. I apply a simple auto black and white adjustment. So there you go. Nice 
solarized Kimmy, just to go back through the history of this thing. We opened it, we went to LAB color, we inverted the image in LAB curdle, and by invert, I mean invert the lightness channel, the black and white information. We went back to RGB and we applied a um, black and white adjustment layer in Photoshop on auto. Okay, so that's that's method number one. Okay, for method number two, let's open up um, this nice, uh, oops, I hate it when it does that. Um, I think the way to really think, hold on a second. Uh, I think the way to really think of these kinds of things is not so much is it solarization or isn't it or is it black and white or isn't it but rather um here are here's a toolbox here's a uh, portfolio a palette of possible effects which one of these do i want to use i believe this toolbox has already been converted to black and white so what i'm going to throw on top of it is a curve adjustment and the point of the curve adjustment here will be to raise it up in the middle like that and pull it down like that and there you have a solarized um toolbox using a simple curve adjustment on the already monochrome converted image. Uh, my my uh, friend and colleague Stephen Christensen, whom I teach night photography with sometimes, likes to say that he stopped using any any adjustment in Photoshop except the curves because you can do so much with it and it's true. In this case, basically, we've done a lot of what inverting the L channel and lab does. We've converted blacks to whites and whites to blacks. Looks very much like an old time uh, solarization would look. And one more example that I'll pull up here is this image, which here, let me get, let me minimize these and minimize this. I call this one, they walk among us because to me, this looks like an alien figure. But what, um, what I can see about it is that it, or what it actually was, was sunlight coming through bottles with uh, colored liquid in the bottles. And there is uh, up on the internet, we have a webinar about how to do this. I also think I did this as a challenge for the Out of Chicago organization, which uh, was a fun, a photo challenge was a fun thing to do. And so it's a good example for solarization. So I'm gonna use the Nick uh, Color FX Solarize filter on this one. Whenever you apply one of these third party filters, it's very smart to duplicate your background layer first. That way you can always back out, you can always put down the intensity of the filter. Um, so always as a matter of workflow, duplicate that layer. So Color FX Pro, here it is. Now, in, within the solarization filter in color FX, there are black and white solarization effects and color solarization effects. But note that if you like the color effects more than the black and white ones, there's nothing to stop you from applying the color effect and then converting it to black and white in a further uh, portion of the workflow. So, I mean, you know, you can play with these too, but look, there are 12 different solarization effects here. This is probably the closest, number two black and white is probably the closest to a classical film solarization for whatever that's worth or not worth. Here's number four uh, color, but let's just stick to the black and whites for the minute. I mean, you know, there's a lot, lot you can, there's a lot of playing you can do with this stuff. Sometimes the question is, where are you in the playing? But that's that's my problem. I can get caught up with this stuff and do it forever. Well, if you find one you like, this is number four solarization, you click OK, and there you have it. 
And thank you very much, everybody. I've, I've enjoyed today and uh, hope to see you at another webinar and hope everyone stays healthy and keep taking photos, be creative. Goodbye for now. enjoyed this video and found it informative. Be creative and stay mighty.